So in this recording, I'm going to go over some of the top topics on chapter four. Uh, I'll skip ahead. I'll skip over some of the other things that I don't want to focus too much on that are there for you. You can look at in the book. You can read through it. You've got it in front of you. But I wanted to go over some of the, the main topics, some of the things that we definitely discuss if this in person, in lecture, if this was a face-to-face -face class. Now, chapter four is all about cells, which if this was a true face-to-face -face class is normally when I have a collective groan of, oh, more cells. Well, the, most of the organisms we talk about in microbiology are single-celled organisms. So when we talk about all of these different organisms, we have to know uh, if they only are made up of one cell, we kind of have to know some basics of cells. Now, I'm going to probably skip a Ahead and cruise through a few of these slides. I just want to get to some of the, the, top, the main topics in this chapter. Now, with this chapter, I will spend a little time on some of the slides that are on here. Now, characteristics of living things, of living cells. Uh, all living things are made up of cells. We know this. All living things are made up of cells. It's why it's the basics for A and P. It's why it's the basics for this glass. There are, however, two types of cells. So all living things are made up of cells, but there are two classifications of cells, eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells. Now, our cells in the human body are all eukaryotic cells. So you spend a lot of time talking about eukaryotic cells in A&P, not realizing that there's a whole other kind of cell called prokaryotic cells. And that's what we focus mostly on in this class. So eukaryotic cells, found in animals, including humans. Prokaryotic cells, these are cells found in bacteria and anything in the archaea domain. Now a big difference, because I'm gonna go through differences, but a big difference between a eukaryotic cell and a prokaryotic cell, prokaryotic cells are a lot simpler. They don't have any nucleus and they don't have any membrane bound organelles. So that's just, they don't have any, organelle that has that phospholipid bilayer on the outside of the organelle itself. That's too advanced. These are simple, simple organisms. So they have very simple cells. Now, some characteristics of all living things. We know they're made up of cells. However, all living things can do reproduction. They can grow. They can develop. They can have some type of metabolism, some type of chemical processes. Most of them have some type of movement or can respond to some type of external stimuli, and they're going to have some type of cellular support. So, now Mike, all living things we know have these. Now, why I bring it up is because we do have one whole chapter that we're going to go through all on viruses. Viruses, because they can't reproduce on their own, uh, they are not considered living organisms. They're not a cell, so they're not even a cell. They can't reproduce on their own. Um, they're not living. So most of the things we talk about this semester are alive, but viruses are not. These are just some basic structures of a bacteria cell, which is a prokaryotic cell. They're very simple, not a lot going on in there. But we are going to talk about the things that are going on in a bacterial cell, which is a prokaryotic cell. Now, prokaryotic cells and bacteria cells do have external structures. They have, you know, there's two major groups of external appendages, ones that are used for motility, moving the cell around, and one type of appendages that's used for attachment. Now, one thing that we can find on the outside as well is a glycocalyx. This is just a covering on the outside of the cell. So we've got a couple appendages, and we've got a covering as well. Now, one appendage that can help move the cell is the flagella. Just like some eukaryotic cells in the human body, the sperm, but there's other eukaryotic cells out there that have flagella. Now, Mike, it's used for movement. Bacteria can have flagella as well, used for movement. Same basic function. The structure internally is different, and most of eukaryotic flagella move in more of a kind of a whip-like fashion, whereas the flagella in a bacteria move more in a propeller type motion functions the same it's to move the cell they still have a filament a hook 
and a basal body that anchors into the bacteria. And again, they spin around like a boat propeller. Now, they, depending on the bacteria itself, they can be lots of different kinds of arrangements of bacteria. Some have one single flagella, some have little bunches of flagella, some have a flagella at either end, some have them all over. Different bacteria species have different arrangements for flagella, if they have a flagella. And because of that, we can actually use the flagella, how many they have, where they are, to actually identify a lot of different bacteria. So this is just showing, showing some of those different arrangements of the flagella. Now, the flagella, if there is something that the bacteria wants, it's stimulated by food, by some type of chemical, the flagella can move to get the bacteria there. My own note, these are simple organisms, so they don't move in a nice straight line type of movement. They do what's known as runs and tumbles. When those flagella all work together, the bacteria will shoot forward. But otherwise, it just kind of tumbles around. And then so it eventually kind of, you know, runs and tumbles and uh, gets wherever it needs to go. Now, this is normally how they're moving around if they're not really attracted to anything or repelled by anything. If there is something they want, whether it's a food source, chemical, something, they, doing runs and tumbles, eventually make it to where they need to go. It's just coordinating all of those flagella to work. Now another external structure, again I'm going to skip ahead on some of the slides, is a fimbri. They are little tiny hair-like bristles that come from the outside. They, if I had to compare them to something on a eukaryotic cell found in our body, I would say similar to a cilia, as they're just shorter than flagella and kind of little hairy bristles on the outside, but they don't do what cilia does. Their job, if, you have a fem if the bacteria has fimbri, is to stick. It's adhesion. Bacteria need to stick. Before a bacteria really can start to grow and reproduce, it needs to first find a home and it needs to, do, it needs to stick to it. So it helps it stick to other cells and it helps it stick to surfaces. So this is a picture of all those little tiny short fimbri all over the cell. Actual picture of some of these fimbri on the cells and them sticking to each other and sticking to surfaces. Another external structure is called a pili. Most bacteria have one pili, but they, some can have multiple pili. Their main function is to join bacteria cells together. They're only found in gram-negative cells, and it's to join them together for DNA transfer. Now, when they join the cells together, it's called conjugation. It's bacterial conjugation. Now, anytime two bacteria are joined together, here's the conjugation pili. They don't even have to be the same bacteria species. But anytime they are connected together, it's never good, because that means they're talking. They're sharing DNA with each other. And if this bacteria has figured out how to be resistant to antibiotics, it can share that DNA to another bacteria. And now another bacteria knows how to be resistant to antibiotics. It's one of the main ways that bacteria are spreading antibiotic resistance. They talk. Again, it's never good when bacteria talk to each other. Now, the, it's not an external appendage, but it is an external structure, is a glycocalyx. This is a covering on the outside of bacteria cells. It's made up of proteins, it's made up of sugars, and there's two kinds of glycocalyx coverings on the outside of a bacteria cell. One is called a slime layer, and based on the next picture, I'm like, you'll see why. And another one's called a capsule. It's more highly organized and more tightly attached. So the slime layer, Again, its job is really to help it stick. Again, bacteria have lots of things to help them stick to cells and stick to each other. This capsule on the outside, a little more organized. But although both of these can be used to help stick to cells and stick to each other, the capsule's got some other functions as well that will help the bacteria. So they both can help or slow dehydration and nutrient loss. But that capsule really functions by inhibiting white blood cells to phagocytize the bacteria. Again, if you're a bacteria, your job is to survive and thrive if you can. 
And so they don't want to be eaten. So those capsules provide some protection. The capsules, because they're made up of proteins and sugar, just like our cells, actually provided a little bit of camouflage. Our white blood cells might not recognize it as a bacteria, as a foreign substance right away, eventually. So they provide a little camouflage. They also are a little slippery when the white blood cells try to eat it, try to phagocytize it. So it's a little bit harder for those white blood cells to eat it. Again, it's great for the bacteria, bad for us. Now, because they can both help attach two cells into each other, they are one of the key structures that help bacteria form what's known as a biofilm, which means a living covering. It allows bacteria to stick to each other and stick to surfaces and cover the surfaces of different body parts. It allows the bacteria to cover various surfaces out in the environment, on medical equipment. And I'm like, it allows bacteria to pretty much find a home and grow. These are just showing some of the colonies or bacteria that have capsules. They stay in their little area. This is showing individual bacteria. It's a specific type of stain we do in our virtual labs. You'll do some of these staining. But if a bacteria has a capsule, you can actually see the capsule. It's a type of stain that the capsule won't pick up the stain. Now, this is showing an example of that biofilm. So this is a catheter, and it's very common for people that use long-term catheters to actually have bacterial biofilms form. It's why catheters need to be changed regularly, because the longer they're in, the more bacteria are going to cover those catheters. So this is the actual catheter material. When we zoom way in, and these are some of the cells that are sticking to each other and are using kind of a sticky matrix to actually stick and line those catheters. Now, another outside structure is the cell envelope. And I'm like, it's the cell wall. And I'm like, it maintains the cell's integrity. It's, it's outside wall. It's just like we have walls in our houses or buildings. And I'm like, they're there for structure. Now, of all the bacteria that are out there, we divide bacteria into two groups of cell walls. We have gram-positive bacteria, which means they have a very thick cell wall and gram-negative bacteria, which means they have a very thin cell wall. Now, the cell wall is made up of a structure called peptidoglycan. Big word, but I use it regularly. Gram-positive, I'm just going to reiterate because these two cell wall differences become very important in ID bacteria. We go over some virtual labs that discuss different types of staining and trying to figure out if a bacteria has a thick cell wall or a thin wall. So gram-positive bacteria, thick cell wall, made up of really thick peptidoglycan. Gram-negative bacteria have a very thin cell wall, so very little peptidoglycan. But an interesting part about gram-negative bacteria, they have a thin cell wall, but they have two cell membranes. So they have two phospholipid bilayers. So two bilayers and a cell wall, thin or not. Now, the structure of your cell wall does determine the shape of the bacteria. It prevents lysis, meaning they're not going to burst open due to water changes, at least not as easily. And they are made up of that peptidoglycan structure. I'm going to scooch ahead. This is just showing a peptidoglycan is made up of repeating units called NAGs and NAMs. And... I just like to think of them as they are just like bricks on a wall. They stack up one on top of each other. They're going to be glued or adhered together next to each other. They're going to be glued and adhered to each other top to bottom. There's going to be glue, you know, front and back. These are really thick, well put together cell walls. Now, some bacteria also have another structure found in their cell wall. It's called tachoic acid. It helps anchor the wall, that thick cell wall, to the cell membrane below it. Um, it can help stimulate some immune system response, but it's just tachoic acid. It helps maintain that cell wall, especially when these cells are constantly dividing. This is just to show there's that really thick cell wall and that phospholipid bilayer below it, and here's that tachoic acid that can anchor the two together. Now, the outer membrane of a gram-negative bacteria. Like I said before, gram-negative bacteria have two cell membranes. An outer one, meaning it's on the outside of the wall, and an inner one, it's on the inside of the wall. 
The outer membrane of a gram-negative bacteria also contains something known as a lipopolysaccharide. Now, the only main reason why I care about it is because the lipid portion of the lipopolysaccharide is an endotoxin. And so when these bacteria break down or die or get eaten by our phagocytes, they can release a toxin, which triggers a lot of responses in the human body. It can cause fever. It can cause inflammation. It can cause um, shock. It can cause blood clotting. It can be deadly. So this toxin that these gram-negative bacteria have in that outer membrane can cause a lot of issues. This is to show that a gram-negative bacteria has a very thin cell wall, but it has two membranes, an outer phospholipid bilayer and an inner phospholipid bilayer. And that outer membrane is where we find some of those lipopolysaccharides, where we find that endotoxin. This is just showing a comparison cell wall. I only care that you know the thickness of the cell wall. Gram-positive bacteria, thick cell wall. Gram-negative bacteria, very thin cell wall because this becomes this thickness of the cell wall. About half of all bacteria out there are gram-positive, and about half of all bacteria species out there are gram-negative. So just by knowing the thickness of the cell wall is a big, easy way to help narrow down what kind of bacteria something is. Now, the staining process that we will do in a virtual lab coming up that helps determine how thick that cell wall is, is called the gram stain. So I'm not gonna focus a lot on it right now because we'll go over it more when we do the lab. The big thing is there are two different stains used, a crystal violet, it's a purple, and saffronin, which is a pink. Now, a gram-positive cell wall with that thick cell wall holds the purple stain throughout the whole staining process. And so in the end, it will show up as purple. Gram-negative bacteria, because they have a very thin cell wall, they pick up the purple stain, but then they lose it during the decolorization step because they just don't have much cell wall. So they lose the purple, and then they show up as the pink. So gram-positive bacteria appear purple after gram staining, and gram-negative bacteria appear pink after gram staining. This goes through all the steps. I'm not going through the steps today. Now, a couple non-typical cell walls. Uh, mycobacterium and nicordia both have a structure in it called mycolic acid. It's a lipid. So it's like, it's an acid, yes, but it's a lipid. Now, why that's important for them, that lipid does reduce some uh, water loss, so it helps with dehydration. It, it, it's an extra survival structure, but because our gram stains are water-based stains, we can't stain accurately bacteria that have mycolic acid in them. And so there's another type of staining process that we have to do if we suspect mycobacterium and nocardia. It's called an acid fast stain. Again, we go over that in some labs coming up. There is also a group of bacteria called mycoplasma. They, they just don't even have a cell wall. They don't need it. They still have a cell membrane, but they don't have a nice thick cell wall or even a thin cell wall. And so their shape is what's known as pleomorphic. It means they don't have a specific shape. That cell wall, that rigidity gives it shape, just like your buildings have shape because of the walls. Well, if they don't have a cell wall, they change shape. Now, bacteria cells, prokaryotic cells, do still have a cell membrane. They still have a phospholipid bilayer, and it does a lot of similar things to eukaryotic cell membranes. They function in um, different types of energy reactions. They allow things to get in and out. They're selectively permeable. But one big difference is the cell membrane in bacteria can actually do different types of energy reactions, making ATP. And some of them, if it's a photosynthetic bacteria, can actually do some photosynthesis on the outside. But the big difference in your cells, if you remember which organelle makes ATP, the mitochondria. Well, the mitochondria is way too complicated of an organelle for a simple prokaryotic cell to have, but the ATP still has to get made, so it's made out on that outer membrane. 
this is to show that, yes, they still have a phospholipid bilayer. You still are going to have some transfer proteins. You might have some other lipoproteins, some carbohydrates. Looks very similar to our cell membranes, but they do some different things. Now, inside the cell wall, it's got some cytoplasm. It still has chromosomes. There's still DNA in bacteria. The only big difference is their DNA is a single circular DNA. Ours, we have multiple chromosomes, 46 to be specific, in 23 pairs, and ours are more straight lines. If you drew a chromosome, you draw an X. Well, there's this one single circular chromosome. They also have what are called plasmids. These are little, I'd say little snippets of DNA that are still in a circular structure, but they're little snippets of DNA. They're not essential for bacterial life, but they still are DNA, which means they could still have some genes that can help the bacteria, just not needed for normal growth and metabolism. Now, because a prokaryotic cell does not have a nucleus to complicated of an organelle. They, we, find the back, we find all of the DNA in what we call the nucleoid region. So it's just an, I mean, nucleoid means resembles a nucleus, but there's no outer membrane. It's just where we have the, the chromosomes, the DNA, tightly packed together in the bacteria cell. This is just to show that all of the, the DNA would be tightly packed in one small little area of the bacteria cell. Bacteria do still have ribosomes like eukaryotic cells, and they do the same thing, protein synthesis. So it's found in all cells, whether it's eukaryotic or prokaryotic. The structure is a little different. They're a little smaller in a prokaryotic cell, but they still do protein synthesis. Some other internal structures found in bacteria. Bacteria have what are known as inclusions and granules. It's for storage. I like to compare them to the vacuoles that some eukaryotic cells have. They just store things. So when they run out of food, they've got extra food there. This is showing some of the vacuoles and granules in there. They also have a cytoskeleton. It again, it just like a eukaryotic cells, it helps maintain its shape, it helps maintain its structure, especially in cell division. This is showing the cytoskeleton. Some have just a cool circular arrangement to them. And some bacteria can do what's known as making an endospore. There's only a few genus of bacteria that can make endospore, and only two that we're going to talk about in this class. Anything in the Clostridium genus and anything in the Bacillus genus. These are two genera of bacteria that have a lot of very deadly bacterial diseases for humans. And a lot of it's because they can make an endospore. An endospore allows those bacteria to go dormant. Just like a seed in winter can go dormant, and then when conditions are favorable again, come spring when it's nice temperature, water, food available, they'll start to grow. Bacteria, some bacteria can do that too. Anything in the Clostridium or Bacillus genus that we talk about, they can go into this dormant state until conditions become favorable again. Now, when they become favorable again, it just means they undergo what's known as sporulation, or actually, when conditions are unfavorable, they go into what's known as the sporulation. They form the endospores. And so if it's too hot, if it's too dry, if it's too cold, if there's some type of radiation, some type of chemical they don't like, Whatever it is, if conditions are not favorable, they'll go dormant. And then when conditions become favorable again, they start to grow, what's known as germination. This is just showing how they can go from a growing state into an endospore state. Really, it's just this nice, tough structure that allows them to stay dormant for so long, thousands of years even. Some say millions of years. Uh, but at least thousands of years. So they can survive a lot. Now, the big issue is because they can survive a lot, they're really hard to kill. If you have a patient that has a bacteria that's anything in the Clostridium or the Bacillus genus, your basic Lysol is not going to kill it. Your basic hand washing, not going to kill it. Even boiling is not going to kill it. Boiling does not sterilize 
these bacteria endospore state, they can survive that 100 degrees Celsius boiling temperature. They're going to need a higher temperature to actually kill them. And so that's when we need to do a pressurized steam. We have to autoclave them. We have to get them up to 120 degrees Celsius for a long period of time under pressure. So I'm like, they can survive a lot. Again, they're hard to kill. There's a reason why certain things require certain types of cleaners and then others. Now, a big, because I'm going to go back here because some of you are going to recognize one of the bacteria that we talk about this semester. Because you may have had patients, if you're already working in the healthcare field, that have suffered from a well-known bacteria called C. diff. Well, guess what the C stands for in C. diff? That's right, Clostridium. C. diff's hard to kill. It's a bacteria that can make an endospore when conditions are unfavorable and allow it to stay dormant for long periods of time. Hard to kill, it requires a stronger bleach concentration for a longer period of time or some type of sporocidal agent. Now, the bacteria cell wall does help the bacteria give it shape. Now, some bacteria shapes, because bacteria species are shape specific. So in a lab, we always want to stain the bacteria to know if it has a thick cell wall, gram positive, or a thin cell wall, gram negative, but we also want to know its shape. So some common shapes, a coxa shape means these are a circular shaped bacteria. So they just look like little tiny balls. And if they are purple as well, they kind of look like little grapes, especially if they hang out in clusters. Another shape are rod-shaped or bacillus-shaped bacteria. So these are long compared to short. Now, one structure, one cell shape that's kind of right in between those two is that you can have some, I would say this would probably be as close to it as possible, that's not round. But I wouldn't say it's like a long rod-shaped bacteria either. And so we do have kind of this in-between shape that it's almost round, but not quite, but it's not really a rod shape. We smoosh the two words together, coxus and bacillus, and we call this a coxobacillus, kind of right in between. Um, it's still considered a bacillus because it's not perfectly round, but it's we just call it a coxobacillus, just indicating it's a really short kind of short fat rod. Another shape is called a vibrio. They look like a curved rod, so I always think they kind of are trying to look like a V. Spirillum are spiral shaped. A spirochete has usually, they're longer, not quite as tightly curled together. Some will branch. The ones we talk about this semester don't, but some bacteria will branch. This is just telling what, the, what we just looked at, some of the different bacteria. And then there are some bacteria that are known as pleomorphic, which means they vary in their shape and size. And a lot of that's because they have no cell wall, the mycoplasma, or they have the thinnest, thinnest cell wall possible that it just can't maintain that specific shape all the time. So some, they vary in shape. So some look like this. Some are going to, you know, in just one patient smear. Some are going to look longer, some are going to look shorter, some are going to look fatter. Uh, they just are going to vary in size and shape. Now, other than knowing what the bacteria looks like shape-wise, bacteria like to hang out together in specific arrangements as well. So sometimes they like to hang out just by themselves. Sometimes they like to hang out in pairs, we call it diplo. Uh, some like to hang out in groups specifically of just four. Some like to hang out in little clusters, some like to hang out in long chains, some like to hang out in little cubicle packets. So it's like a little cluster, but always in a shape of a cube. Uh, and some kind of like to stack up on top of each other. So it's not a chain, but they stack up on top of each other. So knowing what kind of arrangement the bacteria hang out also can narrow down what kind of bacteria it is. So knowing the cell wall shape, knowing the shape of the back, or knowing the cell wall shape, knowing whether it has a thick cell wall or thin, and knowing what kind of arrangement these bacteria like to hang out in really helps narrow down what kind of bacteria. So this is showing some of the different arrangements. This is showing hang out on pairs. This is showing some of the chains. This is showing the little hanging out in fours or packets. So little clusters, but always in a little cube shape. Some like to hang out just in irregular clusters together. Now, the size of bacteria, 
bacteria, they're small. It's called microbiology for a reason. We need microscopes. And one of the virtual labs coming up, you're going to be practicing with microscopes. But when we talk about size of bacteria, they are smaller than your basic cells. They can get into your cells. Now, when we look at bacteria, most of the bacteria that we are looking at, they're all measured in what's known as micrometers. Micro is 1,000th the length of a meter. Or not, sorry, a million the length of a meter, not a 1,000. And so I'm like, they're extremely tiny. Now, if we were going to look at viruses and our microscopes, we magnify our bacteria a thousand times. So they're still tiny compared to a, a millionth the size of a meter. They're still tiny, but at least we can see them when we magnify them a thousand times larger. Viruses, however, though, are even tinier than bacteria. So this is showing a bacteria. This is showing viruses. They're so tiny. We can't see them with our microscopes in a lab. Magnifying a thousand times is not going to be enough. Viruses are normally measured in what's known as nanometers, so extremely small. Most of our bacteria, again, are in micrometers. Micrometer symbol is, looks kind of like a backwards U. It means micro. Now, when we classify bacteria, some of the different ways we do that is one big way is what do they look like underneath my underneath the microscope? Do they have a thick cell wall, thin cell wall? We could determine that with the gram stain. What is their shape? What is their arrangement? Uh, we can also look at what do they look like on a plate when we grow them up? Like we can look at how does these their colonies look? Uh, are they specific colors? Are they specific shapes? Uh, are they specific sizes? We can look at some other physiology. How do they react with certain types of sugars that we may give them? We can do different types of serological tests. These are going to be different types of immune system tests. And we can even look at the genetics. We can look at their DNA to try to classify them. Now, Berge's manual organizes everything into, I was going to say, one, two domains, and then five different subgroups, the lots of different phyla. So there are two domains that have prokaryotic cells, anything in the bacteria domain and anything in the archaea domain. Anything we talk about in this class, only in the bacteria domain. We generally don't talk about things in the archaea domain. Um, not because they're not important. They are still living organisms, but things that are in the archaea domain are normally found in extreme environments. These are going to be the cells that thrive in boiling temperatures. They thrive in freezing cold temperatures. They thrive in the salt lakes. They love the high salt content. They love high pressure at the bottom of the ocean. Those are all environments that are not at all like the human body. So none of these things grow in the human body. So do we care about them? Eh, not really, but you know, they're living, we care. But because they don't cause us human disease, we don't really care about them. So we focus on just the bacteria domain. Now, a lot of these next slides are going to go for all the different phyla and the different five major subgroups, which I'm going to skip over. Actually, going to skip all the way. Um, this is why I was going to say I'm like, the domain, archaea, they're in the extreme habitats. Now, the medically important bacteria that they go over, not even going to discuss it, only because, you know, like they are, we'll go over it when we get to specific bacteria. We've got chapters coming up that go over all of these different medically important bacteria and give us more background on them. A lot of these is just talking about some different families and their shapes and their arrangements and how we use that when we identify them. So I say the only other part that I wanted to mention is that there are some unique bacteria out there that have unusual characteristics. Cyanobacterium is a blue-green algae. Um, it can do some photosynthesis, a unique bacteria. It doesn't affect humans, though, so again, do we care? Eh. Uh, but I wanted to mention there are some cool, unique bacteria out there, some prokaryotic cells. Now, I'm going to end right there with this 
chapter. I'm going to shape chapter five separate. Chapter five is all eukaryotic cells, which is going to be kind of just a quick review from A and P types of cells. This chapter was all prokaryotic cells. Some unique structures or lack of structures that prokaryotic cells don't have. If you noticed, I didn't go over a lot of organelles because they don't have a lot of organelles. They have a lot of outside structures to help them stick and they have DNA and they have ribosomes and they have a cytoskeleton, but they're missing just about every other organelle that we would find in a eukaryotic cell. It's too advanced. They're too simple of a, of a cell. 